Thank you for this invitation. It's really great to do, uh, speak to such a diverse audience. I know that there are high school students and also scientists here. And even among the high school students, I know that many of you know much more than they teach at school because you can learn from the internet. So I was a bit puzzled, how do I talk now? But uh, I thought that I will talk about some very, very basics and from time to time I will really go to a kind of conference type of talking for brief periods of time. But uh, the minimum should be that all of you understand what my title means when, when I finish my lecture. So let's start first from the word quantum, which probably many of you know a lot. So. Um, in quantum mechanics, things can have only discrete energies. So, for instance, an electron that is uh, bound to nucleus by uh, Coulomb forces, it can have only discrete energies. And you can think uh, Coulomb force as some, forming some kind of box in, in space, and then, then you have different energies, they are discrete. And why is it so? Well, because in quantum mechanics, particles are kind of waves, and you know that you can, cannot fit certain wavelengths in a box. There is also another thing that the, uh, comes from this uh, wave-like uh, feature, that um, these uh, states, you can put them in a superposition, and, and then waves, you know, they have a phase, like here it's down and here it's up, and it could oscillate up and down. And if you have two waves that oscillate out of phase, they kill each other, that's destructive interference, and then if they oscillate the same phase, they are amplified. And quantum states, you can now put them in superposition of two energy states, or some other states, and then these interference phenomena take place. Okay, so now let's imagine that we have many of these little wells, <laughs> and this would happen in a solid where you have atoms uh, organized in neat rows, and the electrons, they are kind of close to their own atom, but they can also do a quantum mechanical thing called tunneling. They can tunnel to the next atom, this is, is the picture here. And then, instead of discrete energy state, you form so-called energy bands. So now these things are the allowed energies in the system. They have a little bit of width in energy. And all our technology that we really love, like our computers, iPhones, internet, so on, is based on understanding this. It's really amazing how much uh, quantum physics has done for us. But there is a lot to do also in the future. So that was about quantum. Then, what is Bose-Einstein condensation? Well, there are two types of uh, elementary particles. Fermions, for instance, electrons and many atoms, and quarks are fermions, and bosons, photons and many atoms, uh, are bosons and then there are Higgs bosons and so on. And they behave completely differently when they are together. They don't need to even interact. They somehow know about each other, even if they don't interact, in such a way that fermions cannot go to the same energy state, while bosons can. And now what happens is that if you, your system has very low energy, very low temperature, the bosons tend to go to the ground state, the lowest energy state, in a massive way. I will soon tell you why this is different from classical systems. Anyway, this leads to Bose-Einstein condensation, which was kind of a part of the helium superfluidity phenomenon, but was uh, in a clean form observed only in ultra-gold quantum gases, which were the kind of systems that Immanuel Bloch was talking about. Okay, then about superconductivity, you already know two words, third word coming. So, since bosons can condense, you can ask, can we condense these fermions? 
Well, obviously, they cannot go to the same state, but if you make pairs out of two fermions, they actually form a boson, and then you can condense them. So that's what is behind superconductivity, this phenomenon where electrical current flows without any resistance. So actually, in a material, two electrons somehow interact, for instance, via the lattice of atoms or other ways, and they make a pair, and those pairs go all to the same uh, state. And that's an extremely useful uh, phenomenon. So superconductivity can be used to um, make huge magnets, which you can use here and there. People have been dreaming about uh, transporting electricity with superconductivity because uh, you don't have any energy loss. But that's not very realistic, even when there are some probe stations made. Now, what I think is much, much more important uh, use of superconductivity now and in the future is computing. And you will hear a lot about it uh, tomorrow. The, for instance, this uh, Sycamore processor, which uh, uh, achieved the quantum supremacy, is based on superconducting uh, basic elements and D wave as well. But it's not only quantum computing where superconductivity could be useful, because you can do also classical logic with superconducting uh, ba basic elements. This is not so widely known, but uh, for instance, US and China and Japan are building prototype classical computers based on uh, Josephson sanctions. They are doing it because you can actually save 100,000 times in energy consumption, in principle. But they, of course, need to cool those uh, devices, because all superconductors now uh, work in uh, really low temperatures. And that costs 1,000 times more energy. So there is kind of a 100 uh, factor there. But if we would have r room temperature, superconductors, then the whole 100,000-fold energy saving would be there. And this is really important for the world, because your iPhones and computers are probably not the first thing that you will give up to save the planet. So there are huge things that we could achieve. And why don't we still have room temperature superconductors? Because the highest TC is about 150 Kelvin, it's only a factor of two to room temperature, and usually a factor of two for a physicist is peanuts. I mean, we, we tend to go orders of magnitude if we want. So what's the problem? And this is something that I challenge all of you to work on. Choose to study physics and solve this, and you can save the world. But now a little bit of hints why it is so difficult. So. The electrons interact um, uh, in these superconductors very weakly, typically. Weakly compared to the kinetic energies that they have. Those are big. And this leads to the fact that the critical temperature, where you can have superconductivity, is sort of exponentially suppressed. This is the interaction. So for a very small interaction, this is a big number, and this is a small number. So. Can we kill those kinetic energy? So then the interaction would be effectively very big. And people have actually thought about that. Uh, and you could do it by so-called um, flat bands. So uh, I, meant, I told you how these energy bands form. And um, if you want to use a proper quantum mechanics to describe, there is wave function is called uh, Bloch function. And here I have to tell, because some of you are in high school, you don't know, this is not Immanuel Bloch. <laughs> this Bloch is Felix Bloch, and uh, Immanuel still has to work hard to become as famous. While I'm already the most famous therma in physics, <laughs> and the most famous baby as well. So <clears throat> usually the energy bands have a dispersion, meaning that 
if you have certain momentum, you have a different energy. But you can get so-called flat bands where all momenta have the same energy, and uh, they can be approximately bad, flat, meaning that the interactions are much bigger than this uh, bandwidth. And these uh, bands have the funny property that nothing moves. Group velocities are zero. That sounds boring, but it's not. Because you can work out by theory what is the critical temperature for superconductivity here, and it has totally different functional dependence than the usual case. And here now you could have pairing, these Cooper pairs at very high temperature. And uh, you can actually make such uh, uh, flat bands. Trivial ones are just you just confine the particles so that they don't move, but this is not interesting. But you can create them also with interference. For instance, if you have this kind of lattice structure, now you can have a wave function that has minus phase here, plus here, minus here, plus here. And then you can think, if the particle tries to tunnel from here to here and here to here, these pluses and minuses cancel. So by interference, the particles cannot move, and you get a flat band. These are very interesting. Now, uh, I heard all this, that high T, C, and so on, and I asked myself, OK, but why, why would the pair, Cooper pairs move? Because single electrons don't move in a flat band. And nobody gave me a good answer. So then I thought that this is a good research topic. You should always keep this in mind, that if you don't really understand something, uh, well, sometimes it's just you, you have to think harder, but sometimes it's that the others don't understand either. They they're just talking. And you can really find something out of looking deeper into it. So. Um, uh, in order to have this current that flows without resistance, uh, you have to have so-called finite superfluid weight. So current is superfluid weight times the Cooper pair momentum. And according to usual BCS theory, it's proportional to the effective inverse effective mass of the particles. And that's proportional to the bandwidth, and it's zero in a flat band. So Actually, according to co conventional theory, there should not be any superfluid, supercurrent. Well, we did the calculation more properly. Uh, basically, we took into account all the bands in the system, not just the band where the electrons live. And we found out that there is a new contribution to the superfluid way that nobody has uh, ever thought about it. So we found, of course, the usual result also, but we found another term, which we call geometric term, and that's directly proportional to the interaction, and then a concept called quantum metric. Now you finally uh, will understand this, what is this quantum geometry doing. And to explain that, I uh, refer to uh, what Finnair is telling people in Europe, that they, they advertise, take the short northern route to Asia. So it sounds a bit strange that, OK, first you have to fly up to Helsinki and then to Beijing. But that actually makes sense, because the globe is a sphere. So it has a non-trivial metric. Uh, you, you don't take the shortest route if you take the more direct route. The planes actually fly a little bit like this. So metric is nothing but this, that in some kind of um, uh, special geometries, the distance between two things is non-trivial. And here we go. Uh, I explain you the quantum metric. And this is the Bloch sphere, again, by Felix Bloch, and, uh, uh, which you already saw in Alex's talk. So if you have two quantum states, you can describe them in this uh, sphere. And any superposition can be uh, described by two angles. And the quantum metric for angle phi is sine theta, meaning that if you are just at this zero, and if you change 
this phi a little bit and you uh, want to know the distance between the two uh, states, it's actually zero. Because changing, when you have only zero, this is not there, changing this phase doesn't mean anything in quantum mechanics. While when you are at the equator, this uh, phi changes the relative phase between uh, one and zero, and then it has a big effect. So there, the metric is big. So we found that this kind of very abstract thing is uh, connected to whether supercurrent flows in a flat band. I mean, physics is quite uh, yeah, fascinating, in my opinion, that uh, very abstract things lead to very practical consequences. And we derived a lower bound uh, for, for uh, whenever we have so-called uh, chair number non-zero in the band, we will have superconductivity. And I don't go into this, I just tell that this uh, chair number is a topological quantity in the same way as when you have a Möbius strip, you can have one winding and you cannot move it. Okay, so where would we then find the material where we have a flat band and uh, can, can really build it? I, there are many candidates, but one promising one is two graphene layers where there was a really beautiful experiment two years ago. Here are the energy bands of the two layers. You tilt them by some angle, and at some magic angle theta, you will see a flat band forming. And exactly there, they observed superconductivity. Well, it's not yet in room temperature, it's in 2 Kelvin, but I think this type of materials which you engineer, for instance, by stacking 2D layers, are the promising route to uh, find these flat band superconductors. And uh, our group and a couple of others have already identified that this flat band, uh, this geometric con concept and geometric contribution is important there. Okay, so that was about superconductivity, and now I go to the Bose-Einstein condensate, and I like to uh, note that the previous uh, results that I showed were our theory work, but we are also doing experiments, and here I show our experimental results. But first about the Bose-Einstein condensate, you might also think that uh, simply in a classical system, if you cool down things, they like to go to the lowest energy state. So what's the special thing in uh, Bose-Einstein condensation? What's the quantum thing? Well, the thing is that in the quantum world, they go to the ground state much, much more than they would go in a classical system. And this comes just from statistics. Think that you have two balls or particles, one and two, and you can put them in two boxes, blue and uh, red. In the classical case, or if the particles are distinguishable, yeah, you can put them like this, both in the same or in different box. But if they are indistinguishable quantum particles, then you have only three choices, in the red box, in the blue box, or that the particles are in superposition of one being in the uh, blue, one in red, and one in blue, uh, two in blue and one in red. You must write it like this. And this uh, then, if you work out the statistics, leads to the fact that if you uh, calculate the number of particles in some state, it follows this uh, Bose-Einstein distribution, and you, you see, if, he, if this thing becomes one, this explodes, so you have huge amount of particles in one state, and it's the ground state. And you can manipulate by uh, changing the temperature. So this has been observed in many systems already, but we wanted to stretch this concept. First of all, to observe it in room temperature, where there are only few examples uh, of previous uh, room temperature condensates. And second, we wanted to go to time scales that where nobody has been, to ask how fast can such a thing form. Because uh, to form the condensate, you have to have a so-called thermalization where the particles somehow find 
the uh, ground state either by interacting with each other or by interacting with some other particles. And uh, this uh, we achieved uh, one year ago. So here finally comes the light in the nanoscale. The objects that we want to uh, condense are excitation in so-called plasmonic lattice. So these are uh, metal nanoparticles that we fabricate on glass. And nanoparticles can act like little antenna or dipoles. They uh, take radiation, emit radiation, and they confine also light around them in some kind of near field. And this is special because uh, the scale of the particle can be like 10 nanometers, but still it has light around it. And light wavelength in free space is half micron. But by taking also the electrons into the game, you can really confine light to nanoscale. And it can have is extremely high fields then. So then when we arrange the particles in a periodic structure, we will get these band structures, as I already showed, with little band gaps. And we want to condense the particles here. And the particles are like a combination of uh, light, mostly light, but also uh, electron motion in the particles. And the challenge there was that they typically live in the lattice only 100 femtosecond. So it's extremely fast uh, scale to manipulate and monitor, monitor things. But we found out how we can see what happens in this extremely fast time scale. We did the experiment in this way. So we have a, here a cold nanoparticle array, then some liquid with dial molecules, IR792. And then we pump the molecules uh, with femtosecond lasers so that they go to the excited state. And then they can emit light and so on. They can emit light to this lattice and the uh, light propagates here. It also scatters all the time a little bit up. And then we follow what happens along the propagation. And now that somehow turns distance into time. We can see what happens in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. And to understand what we are doing, there are now two important concepts. One is the band edge energy. We can change this easily by changing the distance between the particles. And then our molecule has absorption and emission spectrum. And this energy where absorption is very, very small, effectively is important. I call it absorption edge. And this is how uh, the thermalization work. And thermalization is the process where we put the molecules and the light particles in high energy first, and then they go to low energy. And in this case, the light interacts with the molecules and loses energy in that way. So this is the thermalization. So we start by having this absorption end a little bit lower than the band edge energy. And we pump the molecules, they emit to our lattice. Then the molecules also absorb the um, light back. Then, because uh, the molecules have vibrational states, you can pump, kind of push the energy in the vibrations and lose some energy. So you emit photons that have lower energy. But now, even at the bam band edge, you can still absorb and go to the lower branch of my dispersion. And this is what we see in the experiment. So here is the position in the lattice. This is the energy that we observe, uh, energy of the light that we observe. And first, we see high energy light. But along the propagation, you can see this kind of red shift, uh, decrease of energy of the light. And here is the band edge, and it uh, jumps there. And we can integrate the light on this band edge. We see that there is never very much. So this is how the thermalization works. And now if we want to condense, we have to match these two energies. And now you still have the same process, emission, absorption, loss of energy. 
emission to the band edge, but now, now there is nearly no absorption left, so you will get this phenomenon of Bose-Einstein condensation where basically light particles enhance other light particles to go to the same state. And this looks in the experiment like this. We have this uh, redshift of the light, and then at some point in the array, after some propagation, uh, we see this bright feature, which is the condensate. And in this type of condensate, because what we observe basically is light, it's very important to distinguish between usual lacing phenomena and this condensation. And here we can do it very nicely. We put uh, the band edge in a very uh, low energy, and here we now, in terms of lacing uh, language, we have very high gain for the bandits immediately, and we see only lacing, so we see very bright feature at the band edge from the beginning. So now I, I will uh, snapshot our most recent results uh, on the BEC, and I will go to quite technical things, but. Uh, so we wanted to really understand that how can this thermalization happen so fast, because we know from our experiments everything happens in below one picosecond. In this experiment, we went to so-called strong coupling regime of light and matter. Professor Eberson will uh, talk about it more. And we pumped over the whole sample. And now what we see is a quite uh, different behavior. So uh, this is the pump fluence, this is the output intensity, we see, see a thres double threshold. First threshold corresponds to lacing. Here at the second threshold we see the BEC, and now we have much better signal to no noise than in the e previous paper, of course. So we see very nicely this uh, Bose-Einstein distribution tail over very uh, long ra uh, range in energy. So that's fine. These are phenomena that we understand. Then there was this medial regime of pumping where we see this kind of picture. So these are just photographs of the sample, real space images. These are spectra spatially re results. So we see some kind of curious phenomenon. There seems to be this redshift, this thermalization going on. And the interference is uh, correspond to the K vector of this energy. But what is really going on, we made samples of three different, or actually more, of different sizes, small, medium, large, and otherwise the same conditions and the pictures look completely different. So this was puzzling. But then we realized that in all, this kind of more empty area, or low intensity area, has the same length and then we realized, and what is going on is a stimulated uh, pulse formation. So if you have a rate equation simulation of that kind of process, it goes like this. You have a pump pulse, then population inversion builds, and then you get the output pulse. And this distance here is so-called pulse build-up build time. And that's this empty area. And now, if we think that we have these pulses forming at each point in the lattice and propagating while they form and die, then we will have less intensity here because nothing starts outside the sample. And this length of this area only depends on the pump pulse uh, intensity, so we can vary that, have different sizes of arrays, and measure this empty distance of one, they are all in one line. So we have shown that the thermalization in this system is actually a stimulated process, and that's why it can happen so fast. We, we extracted that it happens in uh, 100 to 200 femtoseconds. And for instance, if we ha have a 500 femtosecond pulse, uh, pump pulse, which is kind of too long for the formation, we don't see the BC at all. Uh, uh, great. So uh, this is a summary, but I will not stop. So <laughs> there will be a movie in the end. But uh, the main point was that you understand the title now, that quantum geometry can actually give these flat band superconductors 
which may be the route to uh, realize superconductivity at room temperature, which would be really important for the power consumption of our IT. And uh, then we have a, a, a Bose-Einstein condensation in a time scale uh, that uh, nobody has done before, and we have shown that it can happen because of the stimulated processes and strong coupling. And uh, here are uh, my wonderful collaborators uh, who have worked on this project. And uh, now uh, uh, the president of Chalmers was advertising that you can come to Chalmers. You can also come to Aalto. It's not that far away. Maybe from where you are, actually, it can be closer than uh, Gothenburg. And uh, finally, I will uh, show this. Uh, Bose-Einstein condensate presented in the uh, form of a video. In the quantum world, particles possess both particle and wave-like characteristics. When the particles are cooled, they act increasingly like waves. They also slow down and their energy decreases. Bosons are particles which are allowed to have the same energy at the same time, for instance, Photons, the light particles, and some atoms are bosons. At a sufficiently low temperature, the waves of the bosons overlap, and all of them can be described by a single collective quantum wave. This exotic form of matter is called a Bose-Einstein condensate. It was predicted by Albert Einstein and Satyendra Nath Bose nearly a hundred years ago and it took until 1995 to achieve the first experimental Bose-Einstein condensate made of alkali atoms. At Aalto University, Finland, researchers have created a condensate of so-called surface plasmon polaritons. These particles are mixtures of light and electron movement in metal nanorods. Unlike most previous Bose-Einstein condensates, this new condensate is formed at room temperature. Let's take a closer look at the surface plasmon polaritons. Tiny rods of metal can be made to resonate along with incoming light. This so-called surface plasma resonance can be tailored by assembling the nanorods into a periodic array. Light gets trapped between the nanorods and the light is coupled with the electrons in the metal. This produces a hybrid particle of light and electrons in motion. As an energy source, the researchers use dye molecules placed on top of a gold nanorod array. By exciting the molecules at one end of the array, it is possible to monitor the propagation of the particles that form the condensate. While propagating along the array, the particles meet only molecules that can absorb light. Then the molecules emit light back to the array. Because the molecules vibrate, some energy is lost over each cycle of absorption and emission. This so-called thermalization is seen as a collective shift of the particle population towards smaller energies, that is, from shorter wavelengths to longer wavelengths. When the lowest possible energy in the array is reached, the particles form a Bose-Einstein condensate. This is seen in the energy spectrum as a large number of particles in the lowest energy state together with thermalized particles at higher energies, as described by the original theory by Bose and Einstein. The condensate shows coherence over distances that are large compared to the case of individual particles. This is analogous to the overlapping waves in atom condensates. The condensate forms in a picosecond, which is one trillionth of a second, how is it possible to observe something happening so fast? The key is in the experimental setup. By exciting the molecules only at one end of the array, it is possible to observe the light emitted by the forming condensate at each position in the array. Knowing the speed of the particles, the surface plasma polaritons, the position in the array maps directly into time. This opens a window to the underlying ultrafast dynamics. Thank you.